we I'd like to move on to the next item now. <clears throat> and it is um, it's an information item to provide us with an update on the development of license limits for hazardous substances. Specific emphasis on uranium mines and mills is outlined in CMD 1635. This was a request from the Commission made during the April 6, 2016 public hearing. And we have a representative from uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada um, to help us uh, with questions. I understand that um, Mr. Rinker will make the presentation. Uh, please proceed. Good afternoon, Mr. President and members of the Commission. My name is Mike Rinker, and I'm the Director General of the Directorate of Environmental and Radiation Protection and Assessment. I'm accompanied today with uh, Malcolm McKee, the lead technical advisor for the, for the same directorate, and Mr. Bob Loik, the director of the Uranium Mines and Mills Division. We are here today to update the Commission on action item M2011-08 titled Cameco Midterm Report on the Safety Performance of the Key Lake Operation. This presentation follows a memorandum that was provided to the Commission on the same topic in February of 2016. While action item M2011-08 is specific to, key, to the Key Lake Mill requesting release limits for molybdenum, selenium, and uranium, this issue has broader implications for the development of a common approach to the derivation of release limits for both nuclear and hazardous substances for all facilities regulated under the Nuclear Safety and Control Act. Thus, this presentation also serves to update the Commission on action item H2015-14 on setting release limits for the Darlington Nuclear uh, Power Plant. As a result of the information provided in this presentation and the proposed path forward, Staff will close the presentation with a request that the Commission consider these two actions to be closed with a commitment to provide updates within the annual regulatory oversight reports with respect to Key Lake and Darlington and with updates on the overall approach for all facilities in the annual regulatory framework report. I will now pass the presentation to Mr. Malcolm McKee. Good afternoon, Mr. President and members of the Commission. Today's presentation will utilize the following outline. First, we will review current practice related to controls on releases and the inclusions of limits within CN the CNSC licensing framework. This will be followed by a review of the regulatory history specifically associated with uranium, molybdenum, and selenium. We will then present on the status of discussion paper DIS-12-02 on the process for establishing release limits and action levels at nuclear facilities and the proposed path forward within the CNSC's regulatory framework. Since the completion of the public comment period on discussion paper 12-02, there have been a number of major international and national regulatory initiatives with the potential to influence the CNSC's approach to establishing release limits in general, as well as more specifically with respect to selenium. These influencing initiatives will be presented as well as their uh, potential effects on CNSC decisions related to license limits. We will conclude with a summary of the key elements of the presentation and a request with a justification for closing of action items M2011-08 and H2015-14. First, staff would like to emphasize that envir the environment is currently protected from releases from uranium mines and mills, releases of molybdenum, selenium, and uranium, and all other nuclear and hazardous substances are controlled to acceptable levels as a result of upgrades to effluent treatment systems specifically for these substances, the application of action levels to ensure proper operation of these treatment systems and enhanced effluent and receiving environment monitoring and reporting requirements to verify that the environment is adequately protected. 
Regulatory expectations with respect to effluent limits and action levels are clearly identified within a facility's license condition handbook. Current release limits for uranium mines and mills are the federal metal mining effluent regulations, more commonly referred to as the MMERs. These limits are identified within a facility's license condition handbook with respect to uranium mines and mills. The MMERs authorize the release of the following deleterious substances in mine effluents. Arsenic, copper, lead, nickel, zinc, radium-226, total suspended solids, and provide a range for acceptable pH levels. They also include cyanide. However, as this substance is not used in uranium mining or milling, it is not part of the CNSC licensing framework. Additional non-MMER substances requiring regulatory control, such as molybdenum, selenium, and uranium, are currently regulated by the CNSC with the application of action administrative levels, which are also identified as such in a license condition handbook. The CNSC regulatory history associated with these non-MMER substances will be briefly presented. First, we will address uranium. CNSC technical specialists completed an environmental risk assessment on releases of radionuclides from nuclear facilities with respect to impacts on non-human biota on behalf of Environment Canada, now known as Environment and Climate Change Canada, and Health Canada. This ERA was completed under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act Priority Substance List 2. The assessment reported, published in 2003, concluded that ionizing radiation emitted by releases of radionuclides was not SEPA toxic. However, it was concluded that releases of uranium and uranium compounds contained in effluent from uranium mines and mills were entering the environment in quantities or concentrations that may have a harmful effect on the environment and its biological diversity based on the chemical toxicity of uranium. This SEPA toxic determination was based on the evaluations associated with Clough Lake, Key Lake, and Rabbit Lake. Following the SEPA toxic determination, Environment Canada determined that the most appropriate federal statute for managing uranium releases was the Nuclear Safety and Control Act. This was formalized in the original Memorandum of Understanding between CNSC and Environment Canada. CNSC regulatory risk management activities can be subdivided into two categories. One involved demonstrating that current releases were now being adequately controlled or that releases had ceased. The other involved regulatory action requiring the modification to water management and treatment systems. For example, no modifications to treatment systems were required at Key Lake as it was demonstrated that the SEPA toxic determination arose from releases occurring prior to the 1998 installation of a reverse osmosis treatment system on dewatering water releases. Similarly, no modifications to water treatment systems was required for a Clough Lake as the facility was applying for a decommissioning license at the time of the SEPA toxic determination. A decommissioning license was granted in 2004 and effluent releases ceased shortly after. Thus, of the three facilities associated with the SEPA toxic determination, Regulatory action requiring the upgrading of effluent treatment systems was only necessary at the Rabbit Lake facility. The Commission required CAMICO to identify, commission, and operate an upgraded effluent treatment system to reduce uranium releases. Here we see the performance of CAMICO's uranium treatment system at Rabbit Lake after the 2007 commissioning period through to 2015. In the 2007 commission period, the upgraded system achieved approximately 85% or more reduction in uranium effluent concentration and total loadings compared to the pre-SEPA assessment 10-year average. The red and green line represent the action level and administrative levels respectively, both of which were revised downward in 2009 after a period of monitoring to reflect the increased stability in the performance of the treatment system. These results indicate that uranium releases are well controlled at the Rabbit Lake Mine and Mill and risk management efforts were successful. These risk management activities and their progress were documented in an annual report that was co-authored by the CNSC 
and Environment and Climate Change Canada covering the years from 2007 to 2010. These annual reports are available on the CNSC website. Uranium leases were deemed effectively managed under the CNSC Environment uh, and Climate Change Canada Memorandum of Understanding upon completion of the 2010 annual report. Uranium releases are now reported as part of the annual Uranium Mines and Mills Regulatory Oversight Reports presented to the Commission. We will now discuss the CNSC regulatory history associated with molybdenum and selenium. Formal increased regulatory interest in these two substances initially arose in 2004 as a result of staff reviews of existing monitoring data, new science, and a series of, of environmental risk assessments associated with licensing actions for new and existing mines. Discussions between the CNSC and the uranium mining sector resulted in enhanced monitoring and special investigations at potential sites of concern. This was followed in 2006 by the completion of a CNSC staff environmental risk assessment for the Key Lake facility that was submitted for external peer review. This assessment predicted the potential for molybdenum effects on terrestrial animals consuming aquatic vegetation and associated sediments, such as moose and muskrat. In addition, the assessment, together with enhanced monitoring and the special investigations, confirmed that selenium was impacting fish as a result of releases from the mill. In a letter written pursuant to subsection 12.2 of the General Nuclear Safety and Control Regulations, the CNSC required CAMICO to develop and submit an action plan to limit the risks posed by releases of selenium and molybdenum at the Key Lake Mill. In 2007, the Commission further imposed enforcement action on CAMICO with the addition of a license condition with the same requirement to limit the risk to the environment from molybdenum and selenium. In 2008, CAMICO complied with its requirements to identify, commission, and operate upgraded treatment systems to control and reduce releases of these substances in the Key Lake effluent. The results of the CNSC regulatory oversight and CAMICO's upgrades to the treatment system are evident in this figure. The molybdenum reduction treatment circuit has significantly lowered effluent concentrations and loadings to the environment. The red line represents the action level of 0.6 milligrams per liter, and the green line represents chemicals administration level of 0.3 milligrams per liter. The results demonstrate that chemicals taking adequate precaution to control releases of molybdenum in effluent from their effluent water treatment plant. This figure indicates the success in reducing selenium in effluent. Releases Release of selenium to the environment are now controlled through additional modifications to the molybdenum circuit and substantial improvements to the site water balance. The red line indicates the action level of 0 0.035 milligrams per liter and the green the administrative level of 0 0.028 milligrams per liter. As a result of this new, new treatment circuit, as well as improvements to site water management, selenium concentrations have decreased to levels considered protective of the environment. To assess this, a molybdenum and selenium pretreatment environmental baseline was established in 2007, with follow-up monitoring program implemented in 2008 to assess the adequacy of these reductions in stimulating recovery in the receiving waters. This program is designed to document improvements in effluent quality and assess recovery within a range of environmental compartments in the receiving environment, such as water, sediments, aquatic plants, and a number of fish species. Effluent and water quality are reported annually to the Commission in the annual regulatory oversight reports as these are monitored frequently within each year. As the predicted rate of recovery differs amongst the remaining monitoring compartments, reporting of these results is dependent on their sampling frequency. The initial recovery monitoring assessment cycle is concluded with the 2017 sampling. An evaluation against pretreatment 2007 baseline will be completed and reported to the Commission in a regulatory over report, oversight report for the uranium mines and mills. The need to continue this enhanced monitoring program will be evaluated at that time based on the results of this assessment. <laughs>
As a result of lessons learned from the Key Lake mine and mill, the uranium mining industry proactively undertook effluent treatment optimization projects to reduce releases of selenium and molybdenum at a number of other mining and milling sites. Mines and mills that have further augmented their technologies and techniques with respect to managing molybdenum and selenium include MacArthur River, the Rabbit Lake facility, and the McLean Lake mine mill. While uranium, molybdenum, and selenium releases are currently controlled, there are as yet no formal license limits. At the request of the Commission, staff commenced a process to identify and document a formal approach to the development of limits for these or any other substances determined by the CNSC to merit specific regulatory action. The objective was to evaluate CNSC practices or proposals against international, national, and provincial best practices where practical, standardize approaches throughout the nuclear fuel cycle, and whenever possible, harmonize with existing provincial and federal legislation. This activity culminated in the 2012 release of a discussion paper, DIS 12-02, entitled Process for Establishing Release Limits and Action Levels at Nuclear Facilities. The discussion paper generated extensive interest from environmental non-government organizations, industry, and other regulatory bodies. The comment period was closed with multi-stakeholder workshop focusing on a few complex issues. The outcomes for the workshop are summarized in the workshop report published in 2013, which is available on the CNSC website. As a result of stakeholder feedback, feedback on the discussion paper, CNSC staff proceeded along two courses of action. The first was to address setting action levels under a CSA standard, thereby determining a standardized approach across the nuclear industry. The second was to develop a common process for setting release limits within a regulatory document, which allows for needed flexibility when dealing with multiple jurisdictions, hazardous substances, and nuclear substances. Since the closing of the public review period for the discussion paper, significant process has been made, progress has been made on standardizing environmental action levels. This standardization has been achieved through the development of a Canadian Standards Association document N288.8, Guidelines for Establishing and Implementing Action Levels to Control Emissions for Nuclear Facilities. Progress on this standard has been rapid. The work commenced in 2014 completed public review in 2016, and is on track for publication in the first quarter of 2017. Progress on the methodologies for developing release limits, however, has had to be delayed to account for a number of international and national initiatives with the potential to influence the CNSC approaches to the derivation of limits. To date, these initiatives have either been completed or have recently advanced to the point that CNSC staff can anticipate and account for their influences. Thus, it has been determined that CNSC can now proceed to drafting the formal CNSC regulatory approach and methodologies, taking into account stakeholder input and the outcomes from these recent international and national initiatives. The CNSC's regulatory approach to setting release limits will be formalized within the regulatory document system in two parts. At the September 2016 Commission proceedings, the Commission will be presented with part one of a significantly updated Environmental Protection Regulatory Document 2.9.1, Environmental Policy Assessments and Protective Measures. This regulatory document, represented by the left portion of the slide, will formally, docu formally document the role of environmental assessment under CIA 2012 and the NSCA, the CNSC environmental protection policies and principles, and the environmental protection measures at the heart of the environmental protection framework and their supportive CSA standards. If approved, portions of this document will establish the basic principles related to the controls of releases such as expectations for best available technology, economically achievable, or BATIA, in treatment design for new facilities, or in an adaptive management for existing facilities, and documentation of the requirement for toxicity testing of effluents released to fish-bearing waters. <laughs> 
The importance of the latter will become evident when we discuss federal developments under the Fisheries Act. Part two of regulatory document 2.9.1, titled Process for Establishing Release Limits and Action Levels at Nuclear Facilities, is under development and planned for public comment in 2017. This document will establish the approach to determining release limits for nuclear facilities. I would like to briefly present on the status of a number of international and national activities and their potential to influence CNSC regulatory activities with respect to release limits. Two of these specifically focus on selenium. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, revision of their selenium water quality criteria for the protection of aquatic life, and the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, or SEPA toxicity assessment of selenium. Two other activities associated with the Fisheries Act have broader implications for release limits in general. These involve the review of the metal mining effluent regulations and the development of ministerial regulations under the Fisheries Act. First, we'll start with the US EPA. This shot slide shows the history of the US EPA's attempts to incorporate the unique toxicology of selenium and its complex biogeochemical cycling into the regulatory structure of the Clean Water Act. The original 1999 EPA criteria for the protection of aquatic life was based on a specified water concentration, as is typical for such criteria in both Canada and the US. A 2004 draft proposal adding a primary criteria based on fish tissue selenium concentration was vigorously challenged by industry as overprotective and by non-governmental organizations as underprotective. This led to an extensive reevaluation, which included targeted research and the incorporation of additional scientific studies, including those completed at the Saskatchewan uranium mines as a result of CNSC regulatory oversight. This rigorous process was recently completed with the June 30th, 2016 publication of the final EPA criteria. The final criteria are even more complex, incorporating water-based criteria which differ for flowing water, such as rivers and streams, versus standing waters, such as ponds and lakes. In addition, fish tissue criteria are to take precedent over water criteria, with egg and ovary selenium concentrations being the preferred tissue for assessment when it can be appropriately collected and measured. The EPA expects to release guidance on the use of these criteria for regulatory purposes, their use in the development of end of pipe industrial release limits, and fish tissue field sampling protocols later in 2016. The EPA criteria have, have had and will continue to have significant influence on CNSC regulation of selenium releases. The CNSC's initial focus on selenium coincided with the release of the 2004 EPA fish tissue criteria and relied heavily on the new developing science at that time. The final EPA criteria and the new science continue to support commission decisions related to the need to regulate the, re the releases of selenium. The EPA guidance for application to effluent permitting process will be of significant value to CNSC staff and licensees as, a as the approach proposed by staff in the release limit discussion paper was significantly modeled on the U.S. permitting process. Now we will discuss the three Canadian government initiatives with the potential to influence CNSC practices related to, license, to release limits. CNSC technical staff have directly and indirectly supported all three of these activities. Involvement has included the provision of release and environmental data associated with CNSC regulated facilities and CNSC staff risk assessments. Presentations and discussions on the CNSC regulatory approach with respect to effluents in general and selenium in particular. And active participation in working groups and specialist technical teams. The first of these three Canadian initiatives to be addressed is the assessment of selenium as a toxic substance under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. The SEPA toxic assessment commenced in 2013 with two separate reports released for public comment in 2015. The first was a formal SEPA toxic technical risk assessment report with the simultaneous release of the accompanying risk management document 
required for any conclusion that a substance is SEPA toxic. These draft reports were published by Environment and Climate Change Canada and Health Canada and proposed to conclude that selenium and its compounds meet two of the three criteria for a SEPA toxic substance. That is, they concluded that releases of selenium and its compounds have or may have an immediate or long-term harmful effect on the environment or its biological diversity, and that releases constitute or may constitute a danger in Canada to human life or health. The SEPA toxic conclusion identified six industrial sectors as those meriting risk management activities. These were, sectors were metal mining, which includes uranium mining, coal mining, coal-fired electricity generation associated with coal mining operations, base metal smelting and refining, public wastewater treatment plants, in other words, sewage plants, and agriculture. The overall risk management objective for selenium was identified as being to achieve the lowest level of releases to water that are technically and economically feasible, taking into consideration socioeconomic factors. It should be noted that this objective is the same objective that the CNSC is already applying in our selenium risk management activities. While selenium has been proposed as SEPA toxic, the resultant risk management activities are still in their infancy. For example, risk management activities proposed for the metal mining sector at this time are limited to additional data gathering, specifically the gathering of data on fish tissue levels downstream of effluent releases. The draft SEPA toxic determination demonstrates the appropriateness of the Commission's 2006 conclusion that selenium merits regulatory oversight under the NSCA. Current CNSC expectations exceed all of the SEPA toxic risk management proposals. As a release for the final SEPA toxic determination with associated risk management plans will not occur until as late as mid-2020, staff propose to continue to regulate selenium as they have done since first acting on this substance back in 2004. As the SEPA toxic process is not likely to yield any specific selenium regulatory requirements or release limits for a number of years, the CNSC will have to move forward with this initiative on their own while maintaining close communications with Environment and Climate Change Canada. We will now shift the discussion from the Canadian Environmental Protection Act to the Fisheries Act, specifically Section 36 of the Fisheries Act. First, however, we need to clarify a few key aspects of this section of the Act. Section 36, more commonly referred to as the deleterious substance section, is administered by Environment and Climate Change Canada. It quite simply prohibits the release of deleterious substances to fish-bearing waters. A deleterious, su deleterious substance has been legally interpreted very broadly. It is a substance having a, a potentially harmful chemical, physical, or biological effect on fish or fish habitat. However, key to the interpretation of deleterious is that it is the substance itself that is determined to be deleterious by nature and not the resultant concentration of that substance in the receiving waters. Thus, no demonstration of harmful effect in the actual fish bearing water receiving the effluent is necessarily required. The effects of factors reducing bioavailability and thus toxicity in the receiving environment may not be taken into account when Environment and Climate Change Canada determines if a contravention of Section 36 of the Fisheries Act has occurred. Until recently, Section 36 of the Fisheries Act only authorized the release of deleterious substances through a governor and council regulations made under the Act. The metal mining effluent regulations are an example of such regulations. Thus, a permit or license authorizing releases, whether it be from provincial or even other federal authorities such as the CNSC, does not count as authorization under the Fisheries Act. This means facilities in full compliance with their permits or licenses can still face a, section, a Fisheries Act charge under Section 36. Of additional note, the regulations authorize the release of a specific set of deleterious substances and not the effluent as a whole. For example, a mining effluent that meets all of the MMER release limits can still be in violation of Section 36 for any other substance it contains, say for example, selenium as it is not specifically addressed by the regulation. 
Due to the importance to the regulation of uranium mines and mills, CNSC staff have been in, actively been involved in the development of the original MMER and follow-up reviews, such as the 2005 three-year review and the recent 10-year review. In fact, it was during the three-year review that selenium was added to the quarterly characterization of all metal mining effluents, in part due to CNSC staff concerns that these substances may be of regulatory interest for all metal mines and not just uranium mines. The 10-year review was launched in 2013 to address a number of proposed significant changes to the regulations. This was an extensive exercise involving multiple stakeholders extending over two years and covering a wide range of proposals. These involved reducing limits for current substances under the MMERs to respect the BATIA concept, developing release limits for four new substances, one of which was selenium, adding an additional effluent acute lethality test, modifying the existing requirements for periodic effluent characterization to include, among other constituents, uranium, modifying the receiving environment monitoring requirements, and providing more regulatory certainty to coal and diamond mining by incorporating them into the MMERs. The review has been concluded, and Environment and Climate Change Canada staff have reported back to the Minister for consideration of proposals. Some of the general conclusions arising from the review directly relate to establishing release limits under the NSCA and will be briefly discussed. First, formal recognition is now being given to the expectation that technology-based limits, for example, water treatment technology, must be periodically reviewed and revised if they are be to be referred to as best available technology economically achievable and should apply to all new mining developments. This conforms with the CNSC staff expectation and the specific BATIA references in Regulatory Document 2.9.1 to be presented to the Commission in September. Environment and Climate Change Canada also proposed the addition of an invert invertebrate acute toxicity test to the already existing rainbow trout tests as a means of demonstrating that effluents are not acutely lethal to fish. This is consistent with CNSC regulatory fi regulated facilities in Ontario, where the CNSC harmonizes with the provincial requirements. But the addition of this invertebrate acute toxicity test would be a new requirement for facilities located outside of Ontario. Selenium received extensive attention during the 10-year review. There is clear consensus among participants that selenium requires some form of regulation. However, no specific release limit was has been determined. Instead, Environment and Climate Change Canada indicated, with broad stakeholder support, their preference for limits to be based on site-specific risk assessments. This is a marked departure from historical regulatory practice under the Fisheries Act, where exposure-based limits have been resisted, as these types of limits take into account the effects of dilution by natural receiving waters. Unfortunately, a specific methodology for developing the exposure-based limits has yet to be determined by Environment and Climate Change Canada. Consideration is currently be being given to the use of some as yet unspecified effluent concentration as a trigger to require downstream fish tissue monitoring. This conforms with the SEPA risk management proposal to obtain additional selenium fish tissue downstream from effluent releases. The CNSC license facilities are already required to do this where their effluent and ERA indicates the potential for selenium to accumulate to levels of concerns in fish tissues. The broad stakeholder support for site-specific exposure based limits with associated mixing zones is important to the CNSC as this approach aligns with discussion paper with those proposed in discussion paper 12-02, which proposed a flexible approach utilizing technology and or exposure based limits as appropriate. Thus, the CNSC's current environmental risk assessment-based approach incorporating site-specific risk management, including treatment options analyses and installation where necessary, continues to represent best industry and regulatory practice for this substance. Uranium releases received limited attention in the 10-year review of the MMER. Environment and Climate Change Canada proposed the addition of uranium to the expanded list of substances to be measured in the effluent on a quarterly basis, as opposed to the more frequent weekly monitoring and monthly reporting required for the specific deleterious substances authorized under the Act. 
This data would allow Environment and Climate Change Canada to determine whether uranium releases at metal mines in general merit additional regulation. As uranium mines are already required by the CNSC to measure and report uranium for all effluent releases to the environment as part of routine monitoring and reporting, this additional MM require, MMER requirement has little impact on the uranium mining sector. Environmental non-governmental organizations indicated their support for developing limits for a substantial list of additional substances, including uranium. These received limited discussion due to the need to address the other higher priority substances, which were selected based on risk or their demonstrated regulation in other countries. The final Canadian initiative influencing CNSC activities related to the development of release limits is that of ministerial regulations. It has long been recognized that there was a potential for conflict between the Fisheries Act and other regulatory permitting processes. This creates a climate of regulatory uncertainty where a facility in full compliance with their permits or licenses could still face a charge under Section 36 of the Fisheries Act. To address this, enabling regulations were published in the Canada Gazette in 2014 to allow the creation of ministerial sector regulations as an efficient means of authorizing lower risk deposits already, already well controlled by recognized instruments or processes outside of the Fisheries Act. To qualify for ministerial regulations, three criteria must be demonstrated. First, the release must be authorized under federal or provincial law and subject to enforcement and compliance regime. Second, the deposit or release must not be acutely lethal and concentrations in the deposit or receiving waters must satisfy the Canadian Water Quality Guidelines or recommendations for those guidelines on their application or recommendations of any peer-reviewed guidelines adopted by a federal or provincial body. The third of the, of the conditions requires that the effects of such a deposit on fish, fish and fish habitat and the use of uh, fish by man have been evaluated in a manner which is scientifically defensible. All three of these conditions are currently met by the CNSC regulatory process, have been documented in Part 1 of Regulatory Document 2.9.1 to be presented in September proceedings and or proposed within the release limit discussion paper. CNSC staff have been engaged with Environment and Climate Change Canada since the coming into force of the enabling regulations to demonstrate that the CNSC licensing and compliance process meets these conditions. These discussions have been prolonged partly as a result of the lack of formally documented environmental protection system within the CNSC regulatory document framework. This has necessitated a series of extensive communications and meetings outlining the CNSC framework and presenting case studies demonstrating their application. This will be remedied should the Commission approve Part 1 of Regulatory Document 2.9.1 scheduled, as I said, for the September Commission hearing. There has also been significant discussion between the CNSC and Environment and Climate Change Canada with respect to the scope of any nuclear sector ministerial regulation. Opening discussions restricted the scope to thermal releases at nuclear power plants. Though the CNSC believes the scope should apply to releases for the complete nuclear fuel cycle and include all relevant effluent constituents if we are to address regulatory certainty and prevent dilution of regulatory responsibility. In summary, there has been a significant international and national activity that needed to be considered and accounted for before the CNSC finalized proposals for the development of release limits, especially for novel contaminants associated with uranium mining. This slide summarizes the status of each of these initiatives and staff's proposed path forward. Two of these initiatives, the US EPA selenium criteria and the 10-year review of the MMERs, have been completed and developments arising from them will be accounted for in this CNSC approach to setting release limits. The CEPA toxic assessment selenium will require a number of years to work through the formal process before anything such as a federal limit is derived. However, the draft conclusion and risk management proposals support C current CNSC regulatory actions. Staff are therefore confident that the proposals for the development of license limits will be in line with any future decisions related to the final outcome of the selenium CEPA toxic assessment. <laughs>
Lastly, discussions with Environment and Climate Change Canada with respect to obtaining ministerial regulations, while currently on hold, will continue to be pursued in order to provide further clarity and regulatory certainty for the regulation of releases under the NSCA. In conclusion, staff emphasized that releases of nuclear and hazardous substances are currently controlled and regulated in a manner protective of the environment. To summarize the proposed regulatory path forward, the Commission can expect to see significant activity on the documentation of regulatory expe expectations for environmental protection, culminating in a published process for developing release limits and, and application of these to specific substances in CNSC licenses. This will commence with the September 2016 presentation to the Commission of Part 1, a Regulatory Document 2.9.1. Environmental protection, environmental policy assessments, and protection measures. Part one will include the CNSC's role of environmental assessment under CIA 2012 and the NSCA, the environmental protection policies and principles, and the environmental protection measures with their supportive CSA standards. Part one will also serve to formally establish the criteria required to qualify for ministerial regulations under Section 36 of the Fisheries Act. This will be followed by part two of regulatory document 291 for uh, proposed to be released for public comment in 2017. Part two will specifically address technical details on the development of release limits and action levels and will formally incorporate CSA standard N288.8 on action levels at that time. With the documentation of the CNSC Environmental Protection Regulatory Framework, the CNSC is well positioned to demonstrate the compliance with the qualifying conditions for ministerial regulations. Staff propose to continue pursuing access to these regulations as a means of attaining regulatory certainty and efficiency while ensuring protection of the environment. Finally, CNSC staff request that the Commission consider action items M2011-08 and H2015-14 be closed on the basis that contaminant-specific updates be provided within the annual regulatory oversight reports for each sector, that the proposal to include the process and timeline for developing effluent release limits within Phase 2 of Reg Doc 2.9.1 is acceptable, and that updates on Regulatory Document 2.9.1 will be provided in the annual regulatory framework report to the Commission. Thank you for your attention. Um, that uh, concludes our presentation and we're available for any questions you may have.